We are very excited to host the first uh, MFB with Friends online seminar series um, with our first host, uh, Dana Voita. So uh, we are uh, four students, so we are uh, Abil Asha, uh, Ravi Hander. I want to say hi, Lasha. Hey. And Bill Saleski. Bill, say hi. Hello. Hi. Jack Hey. hi. And I'm a Yanaira Zahn. Um, so we'll start uh, in a moment. Uh, we'll just have some quick housekeeping. Uh, so this is the first talk by Elena Voita. Uh, you'll be able to pose question on Dory. Uh, you should uh, have gotten the link through the Eventbrite email. Um, so after the talk, it should be about 40 minutes. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session well, uh, you'll be able to ask your questions yourself, and if you prefer not to, uh, I will ask them for you. Um, make sure that the Zoom room, uh, that you're in the Zoom room, uh, if you are now on the live stream, uh, so you can ask your question yourself. And if you have any issues during the talk, please private message to one of the hosts or send them to the email that is nmpwithfriends at gmail.com. Uh, so we started recording, uh, after the talk, uh, we'll stop it. So you'll be able to ask questions without, uh, uh, without worrying that it will be recorded and go live after. Uh, so now giving the floor to Lena. Uh, she's an awesome PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Lena is interested mostly document level neural machine translation as well as understanding how and how a neural model learn. Previously, she spent four years having fun in different parts of Yandex, two and a half of them, those with most fun as a research scientist at Yandex Research uh, side by side with Yandex Transfer team. And today, uh, she will be talking about information theoretic probing with minimal description length, or uh, as the more fun title, uh, what happened when relationship between Alice and Bob have gone too far. So, uh, Lena, the floor is yours. Please mind that, uh, please uh, close your video because uh, we wish to avoid the lag. Uh, Lena, uh, please start. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, congratulations to the organizers. Uh, I think it's a great idea generally and also with friends. And I'm really happy that you considered me one of these potential friends. So let's start. Um, today I'm going to talk about our paper with uh, Ivan Tetov, information theoretic problem with the minimum description length. Uh, but this is the official version, but friends can call it what happens when the relationships between Alice and Bob have gone too far. Uh, before we start, a little recap of what's going on in NLP. As you know, pre-trained models now have huge impact and are extremely popular. But also analysis becomes vital in NLP. And the combination of these two is a very important and hot research area. And we say that information theory can help. Uh, most of the analysis in NLP tries to understand whether a model captures some linguistic property. In the setting, you usually have a pre-trained model such as Elmer or BERT or whatever comes next. Uh, and you can get representations for your data. These representations may come from some layer of a network or be a combination of them, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you have data, you have a pre-trained model, and you can get vector representations for your data. Usually you also have some labels for a linguistic task. For example, part of speech uh, tags as shown uh, on the slide. So, uh, what we'll try to understand is how to understand whether representations and code labels. So what can be put here between the representations and labels to be able to understand the relationships between them? And ideally, we'd like to measure these relationships and to say something like, this layer or model encodes of these labels better than that layer or model, right? Uh, so uh, what is going to happen? First, I'll show you the standard approach of doing these problem classifiers, and uh, we'll show you some sanity checks done in previous work. These sanity checks uh, indicate some problems of the standard approach. And this is our background. Uh, 
it's going to be very simple. I'm sure you all know, know this, but in case you don't, in case something is not clear, we'll stop for our questions. I hope you won't have any at this point, but uh, just in case, we'll do this anyway. Then uh, I'll present to you our view on the task, the information theoretic point of view. Uh, and after that, we'll also stop for some questions. Uh, and then we'll come to the experiments. And uh, after that, I'll tell you a little bit um, the special parts only for friends, uh, what was unexpected in a way and uh, what was important. Um, because uh, it's really important to understand that it's not really appeared like as it is. It was a long way um, of how this, this was done. Uh, and we'll have more questions after that. I think it will be easier if during the talk you'll ask questions only if you don't understand something and for more general questions, so uh, I think it's better to leave for, uh, to, to the end, okay? Okay, uh, let's start. A standard approach, problem classifiers. Uh, so uh, let's remember our main question. What can we put here between representations and labels to measure the relationship between them? Standard problem puts here a problem classifier, which is trained to predict labels from representations. Goal or uh, after a classifier is trained, accuracy of this classifier is used as a measure of relationships. Right? So let us spell it out loud, loud one more time. So the thing which is put between representations and labels is the problem classifier. Goal of this classifier is to predict labels and the measure is accuracy. I believe this kind of problem is so popular that uh, by saying problem for linguistic structure, people usually mean exactly this kind of problem. Well, it, it looks really reasonable and simple, right? Yes, but uh, you know, there are, there's always has to be some kind of what. But uh, how about we do some sanity checks? For sanity checks, uh, we have some previous work we can look at. The sanity checks are different kinds of random baselines. For example, uh, we can compare accuracy of a classifier of a problem classifier trained to predict labels from a pre-trained model or for, from randomly neutralized model. Surprisingly, accuracy is very close and this is strange, right? Because randomly neutralized model cannot possibly encode linguistic labels. So to find, uh, to see larger differences in accuracy, because we know there has to be a difference. The authors had to reduce the amount of a probe training data. So if we have only a small data set for a problem classifier, it is able to learn something from representations which come from pre-trained model, but it's really hard to do so for, for representations which come from random nationalized model. Another type of random baseline is our uh, random labels. So here, uh, each word type is assigned a random label based on empirical distribution of tags. For example, uh, part of speech tags. And these labels are independent of context. So basically, um, these control tasks uh, measure the ability to remember from word type. Okay. And the authors also were not satisfied with how accuracy distinguishes between uh, linguistic labels and random labels. Turns out that accuracy says that um, pre-trained models encode random labels almost as good as uh, linguistic labels, which is, which is kind of strange. So uh, to see larger differences in accuracy, again, because we hypothesize that, that there has to be a difference, the authors had to uh, manually tune probe hyperparameters to increase, to increase these differences in probe accuracies. And in the end, they had to reduce the probe model size. Uh, we clearly see that differences in accuracies fail to properly reflect differences in representations. But uh, manual tuning is not what we want. We, what we want is a problem method which does not require a human to tell it what to say. And this is what we'll try to do today. So, okay, uh, what I need you to understand now that the standard approach is to train a classifier and to use it accuracy. And it was shown to have some problems. For example, accuracy can say that random models are as good as trained ones and models encode random labels, not much worse than the linguistic ones. 
do you have any questions at this point? So this is our background uh, and I need you to understand this very well. So basically this is the only thing I need you to understand right now. Okay. Um, does it mean I can continue? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think if someone have a question during the talk, you can simply raise your hand on the Zoom chat and Lena can uh, take your question. I don't see a Zoom chart. So, okay. Okay, uh, let's come to our idea, information theoretic uh, point of view. So we saw that uh, accuracy of a problem classifier has some problems. Um, what we uh, do is we try to look at this task from the completely new perspective. So let's come again to the initial question. Uh, what can we put here between representations and labels to measure the relationships between these two? Our main idea can be summarized in just two sentences. Here they are. Regularity in representations with respect to labels can be used to compress the data. Better compression means stronger regularity, means representations, better encode labels. So once again, regularity can be used to compress the data. Better compression means stronger regularity, means representations, better encode labels. And if now, for the last time, we'll ask our main question, what can we put here to measure the relationships between representations and labels? Now, uh, if we look at our main idea, we have an answer. We have to put here a compression algorithm. At this point, uh, I'm afraid that most of you think, oh, well, okay, uh, it sounds like something really strange and uh, scary. I'm never gonna use it because problem classifiers are nice and easy. Well, please don't. It turns out that problem classifier itself can be this compression algorithm. So basically this is it. So what I'm gonna do now is to explain in detail how the problem classifier can be a compression algorithm, how to encode this compression and uh, show you the experiments. Uh, okay, so uh, for this, I'll need some help from my friends, Alice and Bob. Be ready, adventures of Alice, Bob and the data. Here are our heroes. This is Alice, Bob, and the mysterious so far data. We assume that uh, Alice and Bob both know representations, but only Alice knows labels. Bob does not know them. So data, data is labels which only Alice knows. So Bob uh, asks Alice, Alice, give me the data. But transmitting the data is a lot of work. So what can Alice do? Alice can think for a start, and if she knows information theory, she can take a probabilistic model of data and use it to compress the whole thing. So the thing which Alice sends to Bob, the compressed one, is minimum description length of labels known representations. And we'll call uh, the probes which measure minimum description length as MDL probes or description length probes. Now let's take a moment to realize what just happened. A probabilistic model of data can be used to compress data and uh, model. Uh, but uh, we can set this model to be a problem classifier. If we do that, we'll convert a standard problem classifier into an MDL probe. So I didn't do anything. I just changed it. So, <laughs> sorry, it's not, it's, I know it's not the best thing to say in your own talk, but I didn't do anything. I just changed a point of view, right? So if we change a goal of a problem classifier from predicting a label to transmitting the data, we'll convert it to an MDL probe. So if uh, a goal of a classifier is to predict labels, then it's a standard probe and the measure is accuracy. But if we change the goal from predicting labels to transmitting the data or to compressing the data, probe will change, uh, will become an MDL probe and the measure naturally changes from accuracy to code length needed to transmit uh, this data. Now, why is this code length is something better than accuracy? Well, uh, if you paid attention, the thing which Alice uh, is sending to Bob is 
some kind of mixture of data and model. And since uh, Bob does not know the specific trained model that Alice used to compress the data, she needs to send uh, him a model in some way, either explicitly or implicitly. So uh, code length encodes not only uh, not only final quality or accuracy as standard probes do, but also how hard it was to achieve this quality, how hard it is to extract uh, this information. And so this is uh, the data part and this is the amount of effort part. And um, before we come further, uh, just to give you an intuition uh, why this um, quality and the amount of effort is better than just quality. Well, um, let's imagine that we have some information. For example, uh, I know what is my name and I remember very well what I had for breakfast today, right? Uh, I hope that each of you can, <laughs> can say the same, that uh, I'm sure, I hope that each of you can perfectly uh, remember what, what you ate for breakfast today. But uh, do you remember what you ate for breakfast like this day 10 years ago? Surely you have this information somewhere in your brain. It's not just vanished, right? But uh, would it be very easy to extract this, this information? How easy it is to extract this information? And this is the difference between accuracy and code length. So accuracy will tell you, uh, you remember, so you have information what you ate for breakfast today. You also have information what you have had for breakfast this day 10 years ago. And accuracies will be pretty close, but uh, if you take into account how hard it is to extract this information, uh, we'll get a completely different picture. And this is what we'll see in the experiments. Okay, so every time you think about code lengths, remember about breakfast. Okay. Uh, Note that here by code length, we mean the theoretical code length. We are, since we are not going to transmit the data physically, uh, we do not care about uh, the specific algorithms used to, to compress the data. We are just interested in the theoretical bound on code length. So we would just say something like, uh, there exists a, a compression algorithm which can compress these labels, this, uh, this some such and such uh, code lengths in bits but we are not interested in how exactly uh, this compression happens, right? Okay, so uh, now uh, I'm going to explain to you how this description length or code length uh, is comprised with, uh, consists of final quality and the amount of effort components. Uh, let's start with the final quality part or the data part. Here we assume that uh, Bob, Alice and Bob agreed on a model pi, on, on this probabilistic model. So usually Bob does not know a model, but here uh, just for now we assume that Bo Bob already knows this probabilistic model, the model that Alice is using to compress the data. In this case, uh, the shannon Hoffman code gives us uh, an optimal bound for uh, data compression. It states that there exists a code to compress labels with the code lengths as uh, shown on the slide. And if uh, the data are independent and come from distribution pi, uh, which, which come for, from this probabilistic model pi, that this bound is optimal. Now look at this code length. This is the cross-entropy loss of uh, evaluated on model pi, right? So this is cross entropy of our data uh, evaluated with the problem classifier. So this is very easy and this is final quality. And in a way we can say that learning is equivalent to compression because the task of compressing labels is equivalent to learning a model of data because quality of the model, in this case cross entropy, is the code length needed to transmit the data. And uh, by compression, we mean compression compared uh, to uniform code because uniform code uh, does not require any learning from data. So if you, know, uh, if you don't know anything about data, you can assume that all classes have the same probability. And then to transmit uh, one data point, you'll need a logarithm of k bits. And to transmit n data points on the whole data set, you'll need n times logarithm to k uh, bits. So this is the worst case. So this is our code lengths using uniform code. And uh, by compression, we mean um, how this relates to um, compression is compared to this uh, code lengths. Okay, and now uh, 
the more interesting part, the amount of effort part. How hard it is to extract this information. So the final quality tells uh, whether the information is present in the presentations and uh, the amount of effort tells how hard it is to extract this information. And before uh, we'll come to the theory, I want to give you an intuitive, um, intuitive uh, explanation of what's going on. So uh, remember our main idea in two sentences. Regularity of, represent of representations with respect to labels can be used to compress the data. Better compression means stronger regularity, means representations better encode labels. So the amount of effort uh, tells exactly about the strengths of the regularity in the data. Uh, on the slide, you can see illustration of uh, two uh, sets of data points and color corresponds to, um, to label. And note that this, uh, this picture is uh, based on real events. So these are projections of uh, representations which come from uh, MT encoder on the left and from the final layer of a language model to the right. And labels correspond to CCG tag, which encodes the uh, syntactical context of, of token. And I think you can clearly see that uh, the figure on the left um, kind of has strong regularity with respect to labels, right? You can see it uh, easily. And if representations have strong regularity with respect to labels, it means that it, it's, this regularity can be understood with less effort. And with less effort means that, for example, it can be explained with a simple rule, or we would need, um, it would be sufficient to train a very small problem classifier uh, to predict these labels, right? Or alternatively, uh, it can be reviewed, this regularity can be reviewed with uh, a few examples. So here you see only a few, uh, only a small subset of the data set, but you can still clearly see how to distinguish between the classes, right? So this is, uh, the intuition behind this, the amount of effort component. And these two ways of looking at uh, the strengths of the regularity, uh, this is exactly how this uh, wake so far notion of the amount of effort is translated in the code lengths. And uh, now we'll, be, we'll look at the two uh, different compression methods uh, can, which can be used to estimate uh, MDL in practice. Uh, variational code and online code. And they are different in the way they transmit model. So if you remember, Alice has to send a model to Bob. So variational code does this explicitly, online code uh, does this implicitly. So now we'll look at each of them in more detail. Okay, so our first variational code. Here I will again um, ask some help uh, from Alice and Bob. So in this setting, uh, Alice has data and labels. Bob has on their uh, on, on the representations. What Alice does is she trains a model of data. Specifically, she trains a problem problem classifier using uh, representations and labels, and it, she uses this model to compress the data. The data is compressed exactly like, like we discussed before. So the data code length is cross entropy of the model, right? So this is uh, data code length, this green one, is, is the cross entropy, the data code length. And uh, then it's, she sends uh, a model to Bob because Bob needs, uh, needs to know the specific model uh, that Alice is using. And then she sends a data. In the setting, when Bob knows a model, uh, he receives uh, the compressed data and he is able to decode the message. So in this case, the total code length consists of the two parts, model code length and data code length. Please do not be scared by formulas. I don't need to, to, to understand the formulas. I need to understand what they mean. And what they mean is this part is model code length. This part is data code length. So the data code length is easy, it's cross entropy, right? Uh, what, what is model code length, we'll see a bit later. And this is uh, the general scheme of the two part codes. Two part means that um, in addition to a message, in our case, data, 
compressed data. We have to send uh, the thing which is needed to decode this message, in this case, model. So our message is compressed data, and uh, we have to send a model uh, to let um, the Bob to, to let Bob to be able to decode this message. And operational code is um, a specific instance of these two part codes, uh, which states each weight is a random variable. In this case, uh, model code length is scale divergence between prior distribution on parameter alpha and um, learned distribution beta. Again, don't be scared. I'll give you. Uh, I don't need you to understand exactly how this works. For more details, you can look at the paper or at the blog post. Uh, but the intuition is the following. So um, we need to trans uh, transmit uh, model weights explicitly to Bob. If we, if we do it uh, in a straightforward manner, uh, it would be highly inefficient because deep learning models uh, have um, a lot of parameters, right? And even if you have uh, a problem classifier, you still have a lot of parameters. And if, if you transmit each of these parameters in such a straightforward manner, uh, then two part codes would be highly ineffective. So variational code uh, assumes that each weight is a random variable. And this is a very neat trick because uh, once a, a variational model is trained, uh, weights which have high variance uh, can be transmitted with lower precision. If a weight has a high variance, it means that um, when a model is applied, this weight can, uh, the specific value of it, this weight can be different, right? It has high variance, the value is sampled and can have different values. Uh, and it means that uh, the, the concrete, the specific value of this parameter is not important. And if it's not important to, for a model, it can be transmitted with lower precision. So variational uh, code, variational learning understands that some model parameters are important and they need to be transmitted with high precision, while uh, all the other parameters are not important. And uh, we don't need uh, to spend a lot of bits to transmit these unimportant parameters. And this is how variational code uh, can transmit model parameters um, effectively. Again, I'm not going to go into details here. If you're interested, take a look at the paper. And for theoretical justification, um, uh, see the Bitsbeck argument. You can find the link again in the paper. Uh, so um, what is interesting here that uh, with variational methods, uh, we can use different priors on the parameters. And uh, Variational uh, uh, Bison people have a, a, a lot of fun uh, tuning this uh, prior distributions. Uh, but what we are interested in today is that um, you can pick our priors and parameters in a way that uh, you can prune the whole neurons. Right, it's shown on the, on the figure. Again, uh, I'm not going to go into details how exactly this is done, but uh, if you choose a priors in a specific way, for example, is a bias and compression, which we use. Uh, once a model is trained, we can prune the whole neurons. It means that we can get a pruned um, architecture. It means here, uh, when we will be looking at this amount of effort component or the complexity of a probe or how hard it is to extract information, uh, we'll look, uh, we can look at the uh, model component of code lengths Right, but we'll be also able to look at the pruned architecture and note that uh, this uh, bias and compression gives us probe or architecture as a byproduct of training. For example, the control tasks paper had to manually tune, uh, manually um, look at different uh, probe uh, architectures and to pick the best architecture based on some uh, manually defined criteria. But here we'll get model architecture as a byproduct of training. We won't need any manual tuning here. And a bit of intuition. Uh, what do we expect to see with variational code? So if the regularity in the data is strong, it can be explained with a simple rule. Uh, the simple rule means uh, using a small problem model, small problem model, uh, which means easy to communicate. Only a few parameters will require high precision. Uh, and Again, this variational code gives us model size as a byproduct of training, and it does not require manual search. 
So in the end, we'll see, we'll be able to look at the quality component and uh, the, the model size, which was used to achieve this quality. Okay, uh, so uh, to sum up, variational code transmits model parameters explicitly. It will give us model size as a byproduct of training, and we'll be also able to look at the pruned proper architecture. Okay, now let's come to uh, the other one, online code. This is another way, another practical implementation of compression algorithm, uh, which can be used to compress the data, to transmit the data. And in this case, the data is transmitted, uh, the model component is transmitted implicitly. In this setting, Alice and Bob agree on the form of a model, random seeds, uh, and the whole training pipeline. And they choose time steps at which they split the data sets. And after that, Alice sends data by portions. So first, uh, here we split data into portions. Alice uh, takes the smallest one, the first one, and sends this portion to Bob without compression. Since Bob does not know a model, Alice cannot use uh, any model to compress the data, right? If Bob does not know a model, Alice uh, does not compress data and she sends it as it is, for example, using a uh, uniform code. Uniform code, which means no compression. After that, Bob, uh, both Alice and Bob have uh, the first portion of labels and they can use this uh, data to train a problem classifier using this small portion of data. And note that uh, since they agreed on the whole uh, training pipeline, they can do this and uh, get exactly the same problem classifier, exactly the same model, right? If they agreed on the hyperparameters, training schedule, random seats, and so on and so forth. And now, since Bob had, uh, has model uh, P1, Alice can use this model to compress another portion of data. So what she does, she takes next portion of data and compresses it using this uh, trained model P1. And she can send this compressed data because Bob already knows the model that Alice was using here, right? He trained exactly the same model. And the next step, they take all the data both of them have so far. It means uh, the two portions. Uh, and train a new problem classifier using this data. And again, they can do it and to get exactly the same model because they agreed on the pipeline. And now Alice can, uh, can, get, um, can take the next portion and compress it using this new stronger problem classifier. Okay, and, and again, uh, she can send this compressed data to Bob because Bob has uh, the model that Alice is using for compression. And this happens until the whole data set has been transmitted. So uh, the trick is, uh, it's each step, Alice is using um, a model trained on previously transmitted uh, data. In this case, Bob always knows uh, which model Alice is using and Alice, nowhere here, Alice needs to send uh, the model to Bob. Right. So the total code length uh, is code length of all portions. So it's, this is the first portion uh, compressed with the uniform code. Remember, so this logarithm 2 of k bits needed to transmit one data point and t1 is the size of the first data portion. And this is a portion, uh, uh, portion i plus 1 compressed with the model trained on all previous portions, right? So uh, this is the problem classifier trained on previously transmitted data and it, it's used to compress the next portion. And uh, nowhere here we send the model, right? But it would be still interesting to have some, some kind of a model component of the total code length. Because for example, in variational code, we have final quality component, data component, right? And the amount of effort, which is model parameters, right? Uh, and like model complexity or the amount of effort. Here, we also want to have some kind of uh, amount of effort component. And actually, we can, we can do this. Uh, remember that the data code length is cross entropy of the model trained on all data, uh, cross entropy of the problem classifier trained on all data set, right? Uh, and this is the code length if uh, Bob already knows a model. So if Bob knows a model, then data code length is cross entropy of this model. But uh, online code length is uh, code length if Bob does not know a model. 
right? That's why if we subtract from the total online code length this uh, data component, this uh, minus uh, this cross entropy, right? Uh, what, what is left is the model component, like this, the amount of effort component for online code. So uh, what is also important that, um, okay, uh, and a bit of intuition. Uh, what do we expect to see with online code? If the regularity in the data is strong, it can be revealed with a few examples. It means somewhere early in the transmission process, our classifiers will already be strong and our compression will already be strong. And therefore, the total code length will be, will be small. Okay, so if the regularity can be reviewed early in the transmission process using small uh, portions of the data set, it means that the total code length will be smaller. And uh, online code is related to area and learning curve, which plots uh, quality as a function of um, the amount of data. And, and here, the amount of data component tells how hard it is uh, to learn from smaller data set. So this is uh, our amount of data. Uh, amount of effort in this case. Okay, uh, to sum up, online code uh, is a way to transmit uh, data without transmitting a model. In this case, uh, the amount of effort component shows how hard it is uh, to learn labels using smaller data set, uh, and it's, it is related to area and the learning curve. And now comes a really interesting part. So remember, uh, when we looked at the sanity checks at different kinds of random baselines, we saw that the previous work had to either reduce a probe model size or reduce the amount of a probe training data. Uh, so uh, the first one, the reducing the probe model size, we can now see that this was an, uh, an attempt to indirectly manually force a model uh, to account for the amount of effort component of variational code. By manually reducing model size, uh, we can see larger differences in accuracy. It was like a, a menu, an attempt to indirectly account for this uh, amount of effort component. Well, uh, and reducing the amount of probe training data is also an attempt to indirectly manually uh, force uh, a problem classifier to account for this um, amount of effort component in online code. Because in online code, um, so, yeah, so if you have a smaller data set, you can see larger differences in accuracies. But uh, note that these were more like observations. So if we reduce a model size, we will see larger differences in accuracies. If we reduce the amount of a probe training data, uh, we'll see larger differences in accuracies, for example, right? But MDL contains this amount of effort component directly by design and in a theoretically justified way. And, and depending on the specific method to use, which is used to evaluate this um, description, minimum description length and practice, the amount of effort can tell either how hard it is to, to uh, learn labels using a small model or how hard it is to learn labels using a very small data set. Okay. Okay, so b before we come to the experiments, um, let's look if we have questions here. Yana, yeah, do you have any questions? Uh, it seems not. Uh, I think I can continue. Okay, um, so let's come to the experiments then. Uh, in the paper, we have uh, two parts, um, two types of experiments uh, corresponding to the sanity checks we looked at the beginning. So uh, we looked at uh, MDL and random labels and MDL and random models. Here, I will show you only the first part, MDL and random labels. For the rest, you can look at the paper or blog post. Okay, MDL and random labels uh, or control tasks. So uh, let us recall what, uh, what are the control tasks. Control tasks uh, are, are the tasks which are defined um, for a certain linguistic task. For example, uh, for part of speech, uh, for part of speech taking task, um, it defines, uh, it assigns a random label to each word type. And this 
labels are sampled from the empirical distribution of text and they are fixed and do not depend on context. For example, uh, here cat is assigned a uh, label verb and uh, this label does not depend on context. So it's assigned to a word type. And intuitively, control tasks measure the ability to remember from word type. And uh, what we are going to look at uh, in the experiments. Uh, first, um, we're going to make sure that the two compression methods agree in the results, because the minimum description length needed to transmit the data, uh, it's uh, a theoretical thing. It's, it's a bound, it's an optimal bound for code length. And variational and online codes are just different ways uh, to estimate this theoretical, um, theoretical thing in practice. And first, we're going to make sure that these practical methods agree, agree in the results. Then we'll see that MDL uh, identifies control task easily or random labels, while accuracy does not. Uh, we'll look at the amount of effort component and we'll see that for linguistic task, the amount of effort is small. To, that just means it's easy to uh, extract information about linguistic task, but it's very hard to extract information about um, random label. And finally, we'll look at the stability of the results. Okay, uh, so uh, here, following the setup of the original control task paper, we used ELMA model. Uh, that's why here you see there are three layers. So layer zero, it's the imagined layer, and, and the rest, uh, uh, so the first and second layer, respectively. Um, here you see accuracy, and we show um, accuracy um, in pairs for linguistic and control task, for example. Here, for linguistic task, accuracy of layer zero is uh, 93.7. For control tasks, accuracy at layer zero is uh, 96.3. And here is the same for description length, again, in pairs, linguistic task and control task. Uh, and the two types of um, code lengths, variational code and on online code. Okay, so uh, first uh, we see that um, for both compression methods, uh, for linguistic tasks, the best layer is the first. It, is, it has the smallest code lengths, right? Uh, and we also see that uh, the difference between layer zero and contextual representations is very large, right? We, we don't see very much of it uh, by looking at accuracy, but when we look at code lengths, uh, we'll see that, um, for example, layer one is like twice better in compression than layer zero. Uh, for control task, we see that scores become large as we move up from layer zero to layer two, which is kind of expected, right? Because control tasks measure the ability to remember from word type. The further away we are from the word type, uh, the harder it is to extract this information. And we also see that uh, code lengths for control tasks are substantially larger than for linguistic. And this is not always the case for accuracy, and we'll look at this in more detail. So here we see that uh, code lengths for control tasks are much bigger than for linguistic. It means that uh, description length is able to easily identify random labels. So it, it, it's able to say that random labels are worse. And what is especially interesting is that if we look at uh, layer zero, so here we see that accuracy is higher for control task, which is, kind of expected, right? Because um, for part of speech tags, part of speech tags can be different depending on context, and we don't have this information using only embedding layer, right? Uh, but for control tasks, the la label is always the same uh, with no regard of context. So why accuracy is higher is expected, but if you want to understand how well representations in code sampling, uh, this result is crazy. So basically it's saying that, uh, embeddings encode random labels better than linguistic labels. And this is not what we want. This is a crazy thing to say, and this is a crazy thing to think. So don't use accuracy, it's not, uh, it's not reasonable. But um, if we look at the code lengths, we see that code length for control tasks uh, are twice, uh, is almost twice higher than for linguistic. It means that uh, MTL says that uh, random labels are like at twice worse than linguistic labels. And it happens because um, this amount of effort component uh, says that it's hard to extract random labels. And to see this directly, let's look at uh, their 
data and model component of code length separately. So uh, the figure shows the total code length, which is split into data component and model component. So data component is the green one, uh, which corresponds to final quality and uh, model component, uh, orange one says, um, shows the amount of effort, right? And uh, first we can clearly see that for control tasks, the amount of effort is very high. Right, so for linguistic, the amount of effort is uh, like a smallest yeah. part of the total code length, but for um, for control tasks, the amount of effort is really high. It's really hard to learn random labels, and this is this is what we wanted. Uh, and specifically for layer zero, remember that accuracy for layer zero is better for control task, and uh, that so the data component which corresponds to final quality is smaller which means better for control task, right? So this is this green part data uh, component corresponds to final quality and final quality is uh, better for control task. But if we look at, at their, yeah, if we look at the model code length, we'll see that it's very big. So basically code length tells that, okay, uh, I can predict random labels with better accuracy because they're static. They do not depend on context. Uh, but I will need a lot of effort, a lot of effort to predict it. And this is something you won't get uh, with just, by just looking at accuracy. And uh, for online code, uh, let us also recall that uh, online code length uh, relates to learning curves. And here are learning curves which correspond to online code. So here are uh, training portions to show uh, accuracy for different um, for different amount of data. And here we see so solid lines of linguistic tasks, uh, dashed are for control. And here oh, we can also see the large difference between uh, linguistic task and between control task, right? So the amount of effort here is this, uh, in a way it's a difference between this um, solid and dashed curves. And also as promised, uh, for variational code, uh, we are able to look at the pruned probe architecture. Right, as, as shown on the figure. Uh, here we start uh, from, uh, so standard probes has a thousand neurons in each layer. It's two layered, uh, multi-layer perceptron. It's the standard setting used in the control task paper. And here we see the final probe, uh, which we got after, after training a variational code length, a variational code. And we see that uh, for linguistic task, we will we get small architectures only 30, 70 neurons at layers two and three, right? So first layer doesn't count because it's the input layer. You, you, you won't expect input layer to be pruned severely, right? But for control tasks, like attacks are quite dense. And this is again, uh, this um, note that uh, we got this um, as a byproduct of training. We didn't uh, have to like manually tune for this architectures as was done in the control task paper. So the model uh, told us itself that for linguistic task it's enough to have a small probe uh, but for control task to learn random labels uh, I, I, it can uh, do it with a high accuracy but uh, to do this it needs a high uh, a huge probe architecture okay and now uh, the final uh, one minute more uh, the final part about stability um, Turns out that um, accuracy is not really stable across, for example, probe settings. So if you need to train a problem classifier, you need to uh, set some hyperparameters. For example, at, at the very least, you need to set uh, the architecture of your model. For example, one layer model or two layer model and the number of neurons in this model. So for example, here uh, we look at 10 different settings. Um, model with one hidden layer, model with two hidden layers, and a different number of neurons uh, in these probes. And here we see that uh, for eight out of 10 settings, accuracy says that control task is better, that that model encodes random labels better than linguistic ones, which is, which is totally crazy. And only for one setting, it says that uh, for two settings uh, out of 10, it says that the linguistic task is better. So here, if you know the answer in advance, there's no way to be sure that your accuracy tells you something reasonable.
right? Because here, here we know the results we want. Here we know that this is the correct result. But if you don't know it, what would you do? But code lengths, uh, in code lengths, the results are the same for all tasks for all settings. So for all settings, code length says that the, the linguistic task is better. And uh, what is more interesting, accuracy is also not stable across random seeds. Uh, and th this what I got by chance. Uh, we can start the part where when I'm saying <laughs> what didn't work in the beginning. So what didn't work is that I launched uh, the original code from the control tasks paper and I got a different result. This was uh, seed zero here. Uh, because um, in the control task paper, the results show that uh, layer one is better, but I launched the same code probably with another seed and uh, I got the different results. So uh, these results are, uh, I got by chance because I had to uh, run it several times with several random seeds to match the results shown in the original paper. And even if you do uh, willing to and even if you are willing to launch your uh, standard probe several times to see um, which which result is more frequent, even in this case, uh, the scores are very close and it's uh, really hard to make any conclusions about performance of these two layers. It's really hard to say that, okay, we can be sure that layer one is better. We can't. But with code lengths, uh, scores are well separated they are stable across random seeds, and here we can uh, be safe in saying that our layer one is the best because it has the smallest code lengths. The, the results are stable across uh, proper architectures, across hyperparameters, random seeds, and compression methods. Okay, and uh, so for random models, uh, look on the paper and um, this. Uh, friendly part, what was unexpected and what was uh, important on the way. Uh, yeah, so um, Nana, what I'm was... Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. we should, like, uh, maybe take two more minutes. I'm sorry to interrupt in this uh, most interesting part, uh, but we should mm -hmm. also allow some time for questions. Uh, so okay. Try okay. to make it in two minutes. Okay. I'm gonna be quick. Uh, so uh, what was unexpected? Um, when we um, when we be sure that what we want is minimum description length, uh, actually we spent quite a lot of time uh, not doing anything because uh, we knew about this paper from NIPS, uh, which was called Description Lengths of Deep Learning Models, which basically uh, like the main uh, contribution of this paper, the main statement in this paper was that variational methods provides very poor compression bounds and lead to poor model quality. For example, uh, in the experiments that was for convolution networks on MIS and CFR, they saw that uh, not only variational and online codes do not agree, but they uh, like <laughs> they do not agree at all. So we, we see the huge difference between code lengths and variational and online code, uh, like t twice. Uh, two times difference and here it's like uh, enormous. And also uh, with variational code, um, the, when the trained model with variational methods, they got a very low accuracy for their models. But for us, uh, it, it wasn't the case because uh, in our case, uh, what we see is uh, both compression methods lead to the same compression bounds and have, uh, and the resulting problem classifiers have uh, the same quality, the same accuracy. And uh, this is uh, this is, was really unexpected because uh, honestly we spent more than a month like just d not doing anything because uh, we thought that okay um, we are not going to get uh, anything good and if the results don't agree what can we say about these compression methods and so on and so forth. So a uh, takeaway message is if you really believe in your idea just try because. Uh, there can be different experiments, like in this case, different networks, different settings, different everything, different variational methods. So if you really believe in something, you have to try because uh, otherwise you can just um, end up not doing anything uh, you want. And the other part is uh, how do we get this, um, how did we come to MDL? Um, because we know that accuracies uh, are very close. Uh, it means that both are trained and random initialized models contain some information. Uh, but uh, we really feel that 
uh, we still, despite of the accuracy, we still feel that uh, trained models are, are better encode linguistic properties, or they better they have to better encode uh, linguistic labels than random ones. But uh, the problem is how to define this uh, feeling of encode more formally. And for this, uh, of course, we need intuition. So uh, we're thinking, what are the examples where we cannot possibly doubt that the model encodes something? And uh, as such uh, example, we uh, remembered about sentiment neuron uh, from OpenAI. So basically they found, uh, they trained a language model and found uh, that there is a neuron responsible for sentiment. And in this case, we cannot possibly deny that the model encodes sentiment, right? If there is a neuron which is responsible for sentiment. And the next question was, uh, what would be the measure to distinguish a model with this uh, sentiment neuron from all the rest? even if accuracies are the same, for example, from this sentiment neuron and, and random rationalized model. And how, how is a model with the sentiment neuron is different from the rest? And when we thought about it, we came to this, um, so how the, the model with sentiment neuron is different from random rationalized one, for example. That in this case, a very small model is enough to extract sentiment, only one neuron, right? You need only one neuron to extract this information. And uh, only a few examples are enough to learn how to extract the sentiment. So if you have only one neuron telling you about sentiment, you'd need like a, kind of four examples and that's enough to, to be able to classify perfectly. And this is what we, uh, what we, exactly what we got here about the strength of the regularity, simple rule or a few examples. And uh, this is how we came to MDL. Okay. So uh, this is a formal conclusion, so I'm not going to talk about that. If you want to remember something about something from today, remember this uh, main idea into sentences. So regulate it, regularity in the presentations, the respect to labels can be used to compress the data. Better compression means stronger regularity, means representations, better encode labels. And if you ever doubt what is the difference between accuracy and code length, remember about breakfast today and 10 years ago. You have this information, but how hard it is to extract this information from you, right? So for more details, um, I have a blog post and that's it. I'm done. I'm ready for the questions. Thank you, Elena. Uh, 